Um, now we will move swiftly to uh, a session um, on connectivity. And before I introduce uh, four distinguished uh, panelists, uh, I want to introduce um, our scene setter, who will also join the panel uh, in, in a while. Uh, and this is Parak Khanna, uh, senior fellow at the Lee Kuan Yew uh, School of Public Policy at Singapore, um, a global strategist who has also written extensively about uh, connectivity, including in his best-selling book, Connectograph Connectography, uh, that came out uh, last year. Uh, and maybe just a couple of words about, about connectivity, because we, we carefully selected this title, um, and every word uh, matters, uh, so it's new um, game changer, strategic, ge geostrategic game changer, and, uh, and you, could, you could ask, I mean, is it really that, that new? I mean, there was more uh, migration at the end of the 19th uh, century and in the early 20th century. The, the number of people arriving in the United States, that was about 10% of, of the local residents. So maybe that is not so much new, but I think the scale of the phenomenon is definitely unprecedented uh, today. Um, and, and technology is the, the game changer. Uh, when the ICT revolution began to happen in, uh, in the 90s especially, and, and outsourcing of production started to, to the emerging economies, I think that really was a game changer for the world's uh, uh, economy. Perhaps the new frontier could be the virtual presence. Um, connectivity will get into its ultimate form when virtual presence uh, arrive, and we will be really connected between each other uh, globally. Uh, but for now, we need to deal with the extent of connectivity that we have, and I would like to ask uh, Parag now to speak to us for about 12 minutes about uh, what trends he sees in place. Wait, I can't talk without a clicker. I can't think without PowerPoint. <laughs> Can I have a... Oh, great. Now, don't let this eat into my 12 minutes, please. OK. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, deepest thanks to my dear old friend Anne. I, would, uh, you know, I think the turnout, even after lunch, is a testament to your convening power. And I think if anyone can make business as usual not resume after the foresight train goes through, it is, it is you. Um, so I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And to me, even though this is a very good title for a session, um, I, I would remove the question mark. Uh, entirely. I don't see this as an optional variable for us to debate whether or not connectivity is a strategic game changer to the extent that, as Pablo mentioned, it is at, at, at such a greater scale, extensity, velocity than any time in history. So it has always been a critical part of strategy. Uh, when I write about the historical role of connectivity, I, of course, go back to Roman roads, British railways, and so forth. We've always been battling over connectivity but I believe that is going to be ever more the case in the future. So let me jump right in, and I think that we can't talk about these things and we can't internalize them in the way that Angela rightly wants us to unless we visualize them. We're a visual species after all. So let's bear in mind that all of the maps that hang here in the European Commission and in every office building in the world and every classroom in the world don't show you connectivity. They only show you division. They only show you national boundaries. We inculcate our children and we grow up our entire lives actually believing that the political map of the world is the natural map of the world, which is the ultimate irony because it changes so frequently that there's nothing sacred about a political map at all. So I want to start with facts on the ground. And the facts on the ground is this. This is the map you've never seen that is a more real map of the world than the maps that you actually use because this shows you the things, not the borders that we inherited from the British or French Empire, but the, the lines of connectivity that we actually voluntarily have been building especially over the last uh, three quarters of a century since the end of World War II. But we've actually been building physical connectivity across our boundaries between particularly cities. I heard some people talking about that earlier. Really building connectivity among pop across population centers for thousands of years, and it's really been accelerating, accelerating. And that comes in layers. This word connectivity is so amorphous to people. It's so intangible. People think connectivity, and they think, oh, you know, I, I, I'm connected, and they, they say, well, it's wireless, right? They don't appreciate the physical foundations. But we don't have global trade, we don't have financial networks, we don't have internet communications without a physical infrastructural underpinning. And connectivity is a physical thing. And it fits into a variety of categories, some of which I've 
visualized here. Transportation networks are the oldest and most obvious, all of the world's highways and railways and so forth. Then there's the energy networks, all of the oil and gas pipelines, electricity grids. And then only the newest layer, the internet is only the newest layer of this dense connectivity. Now, of course, we've had telegraph cables since the 19th century. Now we have hundreds of fiber optic internet cables coating the ocean floor, again, linking every continent to each other. This does something, right? This changes the patterns of human relations. It changes the patterns of international relations, changes the patterns of trade and economic relations. And it doesn't do away with geography. This is not the end of geography. This is not the end of the state. This is a new and much more complicated landscape that is created as a result of connectivity. We still have physical and natural geography. We still have the political geography. The, the irony of people who talk about the end of the state and so forth is that we have more states than ever before. Right? We create more countries all the time. Just in the last month, there were a couple that tried to put themselves on the map. Uh, they didn't quite make it this time, but they probably will eventually. Um, and so if you want to understand the complexity of the world today, you have to appreciate all of these layers at the same time. This is not an either or. You don't get either or in the real world. In the world of scenarios, you posit either or and multiple scenarios so you can understand different pathways. But reality always winds up being some mix of them. And that's exactly what's happening in the world today. If you want to understand the impact of migration flows on political stability, if you want to understand how financial crises ricochet around the world, you can't explain it simply by looking at a political map. You can't certainly look at, understand it by looking at a map of na natural geography. You have to layer in the connectivity. So it's not about one or the other but all of them, and that's cartographic complexity. So let me jump into how this impacts certain specific geographies. Let's just take the most obvious geography right here in Europe, which of course leads the world in transnational physical uh, connectivity. I think we, I don't need to rehash the story for anyone in this room around what, what impact that has had on European uh, relations, from the ways in which economies have come together to if you look at energy markets. This is just the oil and gas pipelines leaving out uh, um, uh, leaving out uh, electricity grids and so forth, you find that this is the best evidence alongside the euro uh, that Europe is an egg that is very hard to unscramble, right? Uh, a country like Germany wants to go non-nuclear in energy, but of course imports French nuclear power, right? It's very, very difficult. And the, and the more, the further along we go in terms of uh, re-regulating and harmonizing various sectors of the European economy, the more difficult it would ever become to, to, uh, to untangle it. And we see more and more efforts at transnational infrastructure, coordination around utilities, uh, banking systems, telecoms, and so forth. So in every possible sector, you see more coordination. And as an aside, other regions are copying that model. I find it hot, supremely ironic. I mean, the last 10 years now since the financial crisis and people talking about the end of Europe and the collapse of Europe, this is exactly the, la the decade in which uh, Latin America, uh, Southeast Asia, East Africa, and other parts of the world are saying, you know what, Europe really did something right. We need to copy that model. Um, and they're doing their best to try and emulate this map. Um, the emerging markets really are. I think what's so interesting from a geopolitical standpoint, to take just one example, is looking at Euro-Russian relations. Because if you think about uh, your, your, uh, uh, Russian threats of cutting off uh, particularly gas flows to Ukraine while also wanting to build Nord Stream and Nord Stream 2, you create the opportunity for Germany to uh, facilitate reverse flows of gas to Ukraine via Poland. So you have Russia pursuing one policy of isolation towards Ukraine, while on the other hand, selling gas to its largest customer that then recycles it back to Ukraine, potentially. So you've got, again, you can't see that, you can't even appreciate how infrastructure impacts geopolitics unless you map out the physical connectivity that makes, these, that makes geopolitics so much more complicated than simply saying one country's army marches across the border, take some territory and that's it. It's a lot more complicated than that. And the point of the story is also that it's also at the value of the infrastructure. At the end of the day, the, the terrain, the, the post-industrial, the not unproductive post-industrial terrain of Eastern Ukraine is not nearly as valuable as the flows of commodities through pipelines, right? So if you're not mapping that, you're also not even understanding the psychology of the players involved, where more and more we're thinking about the lucrative nature of the infrastructural assets rather than simply territorial aggrandizement in some 19th century sense. And I've seen way too many magazine covers that have said, um, you know, uh, Putin is the new Stalin and this is the 19th century czarism returning. It's nothing of the sort. 
right? Nothing of the sort. There are inherent limitations to what any territorial power can take from any other territorial power today without incurring very significant costs. They are much better served in their interests. And if you look at what they're doing, what they're actually pursuing is trying to control this connectivity over the infrastructure, which is so much more valuable. Now, let's look at how connectivity plays out from the standpoint of the, the fact that all of this infrastructure has facilitated such an enormous volume of global economic flows, particularly in trade. It's been an article of faith, it's been a, 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 a sort of a macroeconomic fact that the most dense economic relationship in the world since the end of the, uh, since, since in the post-Cold War era has been the transatlantic relationship, which has reached more than $1 trillion of trade, goods and services every single year. But there's limited upside to that now if you think about the slow growth in Europe and in the US and the lack of progress on the TTIP and, uh, and so forth, and generally some soft protectionist measures, particularly coming out of the US. So you could, if we were to reconvene in, in 10 years, um, you know, chances are that transatlantic trade volumes might be 1.5, 1.6 trillion, something like that, not, not particularly special. Now, if you start to aggregate Europe's trade relations with Asia, Right, and Asia is not one thing, it's not the European Union, it's not the Asian Union, but it has very distinct economic pillars like China, India, South Korea, Japan, ASEAN, Australia, and so forth. If you add that up today, today, not, we don't have to do futurism right now, uh, today it's already $1.6 trillion. It's already a lot more. So you Europeans in this room, you have more substantial, more significant, far more significant trade relations today with Asia than you have with America. Right. So already we're past this idea of the transatlantic economic axis and anchor of the world economy. We are way past it. And the interesting thing here is that typically what it takes to get to that point where you have such intensity and a volume of trade relations is not just simple supply and demand, but you would expect to have free trade agreements and very, very uh, frictionless infrastructural linkages, right? You have neither with Asia, and yet already you have more trade with Asia. You have only have a free trade agreement with uh, Singapore, I guess, and uh, South Korea, uh, not yet with India, not yet with Japan, although there's there talk about it, and you haven't even granted market economy status to China. And despite that, you have more trade with Asia. So what comes next? The trade agreements are being negotiated and the infrastructure is being built. So, again, the, the connectivity as a strategic game changer is, most, is best physically embodied in the Belt and Road Initiative, right? The, the new Silk Roads and so forth. So, what I've done is to kind of, all the, all the countries on this map that I've been traveling to a lot over the last 20 years, I go them, I go there and I say, what are the projects you want to build? What are the railways, the pipelines, the internet grids, uh, the, the internet cables, the electricity grids, and so forth that you want to take multilateral money or Chinese money uh, or European money and build? And who do you want to connect to most? Who, are your, who do you see as the, the most important future trade partners and so forth? And you get a map like this that really shows you pretty much exactly what the Belt and Road Project is going to look like over the next quarter century, how it's going to unfold. And as you know, you already have dozens of trains a week going back and forth between southern China, across Central Asia, uh, to Western Europe, to Germany, and back, and you have European uh, um, uh, uh, sort of commercial actors capitalizing on the two-way flow more and more. So I expect this to, to really flourish in the coming, uh, coming decades. No matter what you hear about backlash against China, suspicion about China, uh, I've heard it all. I go to those countries. I go to Kazakhstan, Mongolia, Myanmar, everywhere. I, I know every story about the backlash against China. But still, what you're talking about here is a set of countries that are either post-colonial or post-Soviet. They're overpopulated, they're poor, they are frail. They desperately need very, very significant inflows of infrastructure finance, and they're finally starting to get it. Um, it matters less to them who it comes from than that, it, that it's there, and whatever backlash exists is, is more than overcompensated by the desperate need they have for it. So I fully expect this map to be built, and it's being built every single day, and Europe, you would, wouldn't be, uh, as you all know all too well, is a very active participant uh, in this. When the Obama administration wanted European governments not to sign on to the AIB, all of you did it anyway. And I think you did the right thing because you were looking at this and seeing the trade data, right? So there's all this talk about Europe is weak, Europe has no strategy, Europe has no plan. It, it may be there on paper and people don't see it translating in reality, but on the ground in terms of the way European commercial actors are operating, and the way decision-making is playing out, 
Um, it clearly isn't articulated in one provocative way, but it is happening. There is this convergence uh, happening economically uh, between, um, uh, between Europe and Asia, and, and, and this is what it looks like. And this also has a significant impact on the ways in which uh, we, we deal with states of concern, states that, again, there's very significant transatlantic discrepancy about how to deal with Russia, how to deal with Turkey, how to deal with Iran. The more connected a country becomes, even North Korea, the, the, the actual impossibility ability take shape of ever actually successfully isolating that country. That's, again, an iron law, if you will. And so it'll be very difficult to isolate countries the more connected they get. Just look at uh, what we hear about um, Chinese strategy towards uh, North Korea. We hear about China coming on board and starting to you know, cut off internet cables and so forth. There is almost nothing that China provides North Korea that Russia cannot substitute for and is already substituting for when it comes to energy, resources, and other sorts of things. So, Connectivity is most definitely a game changer. So final point that I just want to make, because I'm, I'm out of time, but I see the kind of diagram of world power playing out uh, a lot more like this than the kind of very conventional unipolar or G2 sorts of cliches and visions. Uh, we're actually entering a truly un unprecedented era. This is something that is, in fact, new. We've never lived in a time where every continent or every region of the world actually mattered at the same time, and where they had... In De decreasingly hierarchical relationships with each other. We no longer have a global colonial sort of you know unipolar uh, imperial system. Nothing of the sort. We have voluntary relationships across all these regions. We have, if you pick any two pair of regions in the world, whether it's South America with Africa, or Asia with Africa, or Middle East with South America, you see triple or quadruple digit growth rates in the intensity of trade and investment relations between them. And this is all voluntary. There is no power at the center, not the United States, not China, that can turn this system on or off. And that's, that, that's what's interesting about globalization that you have to understand. That when people talk about deglobalization, what they're actually saying is that their own country from their own perspective appears to be playing less of a role in the global system. But globalization doesn't stop just because. Just look at the TPP agreement as a perfect example. Everyone wrote about Trump's pulling the US out of TPP as if it would be the death of global trade. Instead, you had all the other countries say, actually, we're going to go ahead with TPP. That's the way globalization works. It works around any obstacle. And that, to me, is truly new. That's a global network order. And of course, it would not be possible without the force of connectivity. It has positive implications and negative implications, right? I think that it's a more stable order. I don't think you can map 19th century European uh, history in terms of thinking about uh, whether or not unipolar or multipolar orders are most stable onto a global landscape where geography actually matters more. Um, in terms of the distribution of power, you have to view it in the novel as a novel situation that it actually is. And it has negative implications because, of course, when it comes to uh, even uh, Belt and Road and other infrastructure initiatives, you're going to see a lot more com competitive tension over controlling those assets uh, and the value of those assets. You can already imagine what will happen when there's debt defaults uh, in countries that, that, that owe a lot of money to China for their energy grids and the asset seizures that are going to take place. That is connectivity as a battlefield. It's, it's a huge economic multiplier for the world economy. It's a great boon for global society as a whole. It is the reason why countries like China and India are less poor today. It is the cause of all of those positive things. But we also have to switch our minds uh, to realize that, that just looking at borders and tensions across borders is not even a fraction of the real geopolitical story when it comes to what we'll be fighting about in the future. It's going to be more and more connectivity as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Parag, for this fascinating uh, journey and for showing us that connectivity is, in fact, a living uh, phenomenon. It reflects uh, not only the reality of, uh, of today, but also our uh, aspiration for the future. We will now be joined by uh, three other distinguished uh, uh, panelists, uh, Ulrich Schulte-Strathaus, who is an aviation industry uh, expert, uh, Christine Schikupfer, who is director for research at the Mercator Institute for uh, China Policy, and Jason Blackstock, who is uh, head of Department for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Public Policy. You can see from the name of the department that it's an interdisciplinary uh, place at the University College uh, London. So I will start with, uh, with Ulrich, um, um, who um, held various management positions at uh, Lufthansa, 
um, before uh, moving into the broader field of uh, policy making uh, in the field of aviation. Um, and I would like to ask Ulrich uh, to tell us uh, about the dynamic in the sector. Uh, we normally tend to see aviation as, as being about taking us from place A to place B, but you argued in a, in a piece for us that it's in fact a, a mature uh, sector which uh, facilitates uh, growth by itself. So tell us how you see aviation developing in the future. Thank you very much indeed and, and good afternoon. Um, I must say, I, I really felt that it was a wonderful idea and I was extremely grateful when I was um, invited by Anne to, to attend this event today. I thought, yes, it is time to, to reinvigorate um, ESPAS, the European Strategic Partnership for Aviation Security, which uh, <laughs> had been one of my, my favorite pets for, for, for many years. Um, when I said so, Anne just looked at me sadly and uh, told me to, gave me the link to this conference and said, watch this eSpace, uh, and which I then did. It's not, of course, about aviation security here today, but uh, does provide me with the honor and, and the privilege of uh, answering some of the points that have been raised and talking about what connectivity uh, means for aviation. But before doing so, let me just really plead with you uh, to bear with me for two or three minutes because I really have to go back to basics. I mean, this is, you know, the discussion that we had was essentially, what do you mean strategic foresight? Uh, we're here to earn money. It, it, there are two different worlds met. So I do have to go back to basics and, and try and outline uh, how aviation ticks, not in the sense of um, uh, delayed aircraft, but how the system works. Um, flying people and goods from A to B, um, that provides for a connection uh, between two cities. And for many decades after the Second World War, airspace um, of a foreign country was considered to be an integral element of sovereignty. Accessing that airspace required regulatory, regulatory approval. Uh, that was only granted on the basis of reciprocity. So whether you were Fiji or the USA, you, you had an equal say. So connecting two cities in two different countries was governmentally driven and it was part of a transportation policy um, of that government to provide for connections by air, water, uh, sea uh, or rail. Now over time, commercial airlines uh, began gaining market data and saw the traffic flows. Uh, they do not all begin at A and end at B, to stay with that example. They originate in other cities and um, go to other cities, but perhaps use the route A to B as intermediate points. So passengers flying, for example, um, from Brussels to Washington uh, may actually be coming from Africa and using the Brussels to connect to Washington, or they may be flying um, to Washington to connect to, I don't know, Boise, Idaho. So what was first a commercial agreement, sorry, a governmental agreement to grant traffic rights to connect two cities, then became the issue of operational efficiency of network airlines to optimally connect incoming with outgoing passengers. Now, this is where it gets really basic. Let me briefly walk you through this. Figuratively speaking, when five aircraft connect in the way they do on the left side of this chart, you have five city pairs, right? Now, if the same five aircraft go to an intermediate point, and let's call that for the sake of the argument a hub, and leave at the same time, say, 45 minutes later when all those passengers have scrambled from one aircraft to another, you have actually created 54 connections. Why? Because you can go from a to that intermediate point, and then to B, and then from A to C, and then from A to D, and that kind of leaves you with 10, 10, 10 city pairs, and you can do the same from B, and so on. Believe me, you, you arrive at 54 connections. More concretely, Carco can have, if you're a firm in Carco, and, and you want to get your products shifted, uh, transported to the rest of the world, um, there are nearly 5,000 destinations that you can access if you connect them via Warsaw but 13,000 destinations if you connect them by Munich. You'll probably choose Munich to ship those products. Right? It's called the principle of network externalities. The bigger the network, the more competitive it becomes. So this means that the operational efficiency of the airlines then um, of connecting incoming with outgoing became 
an issue of competition between those hub airports, and it became an issue of strategic and economic value for nations. Why? Because the higher the level of connectivity of a given hub, the greater the attractiveness for an investor, for banks, for international corporations to establish regional headquarters, because from that main airport they can access any destination in the world conveniently. And for goods, it's the same, it's the same logic. Now, realizing that simply pumping oil out of the earth would not be a sustainable source of income in the long term, the um, United Arab Emirates declared aviation to be a strategic sector of the region. Three airlines based within a few hundred kilometers from each other in Doha, Abu Dhabi and Dubai respectively became within 15 years the fastest growing airlines, the airports the fastest growing airports. This is not because the 800,000 inhabitants of Doha all of a sudden developed a craving for air travel. The growth was not driven by local uh, population, but by connecting outgoing with incoming passenger flows to become effectively global mega hubs. Dubai Airport has a capacity for 63 million uh, passengers, Abu Dhabi for 24.5 million passengers annually, and Doha's new Hamad International Airport can handle 38 million passengers annually. All of these airports are by far larger than required by their local uh, inhabitants, but they are the infrastructure required to ensure connectivity. It was a successful strategy because of the ge geographic location of these Gulf uh, cities, quasi in the center of many long haul routes. Euro Asia's new Silk Road, but by air, so to speak. Now, by having passengers from, say, Nice uh, and other passengers flying from smaller airports in Europe arrive in Doha at essentially the same time, Qatar Airways can connect all these passengers from Doha to Phuket in Thailand, just to give an example. And as a consequence of this geographic shift, the European airports lose traffic for international connections. Millions of passengers consider flying an Arab airline to be a sensible option to arrive conveniently and at a lower price at their final destination. Aviation has become a facilitator of economic growth. The issue in international aviation is no longer for governments. How can I best provide the population of my country with the air service agreements necessary to enable connections? The issue is, how can the aviation industry of a given country improve its global reach geopolitically? This new approach is nothing less than a paradigm shift for aviation. Bilateral air service agreements based on sovereignty and reciprocal rights are being eroded by market forces which rely on their geopolitical location to improve global competitiveness. And that did not start with the Gulf carriers. KLM in the 70s developed the concept of hubs, Singapore Airlines in the 80s, the notion of global reach. But the dimension of the Gulf air carriers and uh, global reach is new. And the development doesn't end there. Turkish Airlines was widely assumed to be emulating the success story of the Gulf carriers. Turkey has, in addition to its geopolitical location and important traditional own domestic industries, strong trade ties, significant domestic population, so ideal conditions. The development has eroded recently uh, due to the political agenda there. But still, we are expecting Turkey to continue playing an important role. A new truly, a truly new dimension may arise when the Republic of China, that has been mentioned frequently today, turns its sights onto international aviation. It's doubtful whether one of the world's most powerful economic, political and military nations will allow its affluent middle class, estimated at 300 million people who need to fly internationally for, for trade purposes and who want to fly for leisure, to do so on non-Chinese airlines. Now, a AP stands for airport and AL stands for airline. So, depending on who invests into connectivity, global connectivity can actually be established without European airlines or European air uh, hub airports. It depends on how much interest and how much money and how much value and how much strategic weight you, you place on connectivity. Those regions will fail economically that have no leverage to attract investors to improve their connectivity. 
The good news is that the European Union combines the strategic forward thinking with excellent work at service level. This, what you see here, is a snapshot of the website of DG Move, and it shows a connectivity index. It's interactive, and you simply have to believe me. At the touch of a given point on that map, it will show you the level of transport connectivity of that city or region. The lighter shades of brown show less connectivity, the fingertip touch explains the details, and it requires little imagination to foresee that such an index could be used to determine if and when and how such an underserved region uh, should be entitled to access uh, regional funds to improve its connectivity ranking. In fact, such a connectivity-driven approach could even become a template globally and gradually replace traffic right agreements. So, my core observations in a nutshell, global aviation has always been about connections, it's now about connectivity. In aviation, connectivity has a geopolitical, economic, strategic and commercial connotation. It's not just about aircraft, noisily or not so noisily, flying from A to B. And connectivity is the game changer in aviation. It could become a disruptive factor, but perhaps we can discuss that later and will require a global regulatory framework if global aviation is to facilitate sustainable economic growth. Thank you. Ulrich, thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Ulrich, thank you very much for disentangling for us what happens in the um, aviation industry. Um, one, one feels that the experience of uh, air travel hasn't changed that much, but you have clearly shown to us that a lot has changed. Uh, um, beyond uh, the surface. So, um, now, turning to, to Christine, um, you lead Mercator Institute's um, research on um, um, society, on media, on politics uh, of, of China, and, and clearly connectivity is, is at the heart of uh, what, uh, what China is up to, um, also with respect to data-driven innovation, not just the physical uh, connectivity. Perhaps the one built, one road comes, comes to mind first when one hears connectivity. But, uh, uh, but the second thing that comes to my mind when I hear connectivity in China is the super app, uh, is, the, uh, is yeah. the particular predilection of uh, Chinese and Asian um, uh, people for um, doing using, for doing everything, for doing everything at once in one single app. Uh, so this is the kind of hyper connectivity, which uh, which I think is, uh, is is distinct for for China in particular. So how how do you see things uh, uh, developing, and um, and what implications does that have for us? You've done my talk. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Basically. I'll Thank you very much, first of all, for the invitation and really for the opportunity to get plugged in such a vibrant uh, community of people who uh, deeply care about the future. Um, before I start, because this is an image which kind of has come back to me since uh, yesterday evening, I would very briefly invite you to uh, imagine or to recall your fascination and maybe even sense of awe you have, or maybe still have, I had that yesterday, when the plane you're on is kind of descending into uh, the city area and the lines of light which you see from above kind of um, evolve into dots of lights. And this for me is an image of connectivity. If we have the lines, but when we folk zoom in, we have the individual dots, the street lamps, and both of it is important. And I will come back to this at the very end of my talk. So um, my overall message today is the Chinese government's push for connectivity should be a global wake-up call. Why? Um, three key messages. First of all, we should definitely learn from it from the boldness of its vision, of its stated vision by the Chinese leadership, and also the scope and the horizon of its planning. Uh, message number two, we should be knowledgeable about its internal risks and contradiction, and I was very glad that uh, Professor Chu pointed out also the internal Chinese debates related to, um, for example, the Belt and Road Initiative. And we should be uh, on alert against its declared by the Chinese uh, Communist Party challenge to our concepts of order on which our liberal democracies are based on. Message number three, um, we should be uh, more 
courageous um, and more inviting also as a reaction to Chinese concepts of connectivity to really offer a vision of connectivity which evolve into really a community offering individuals to become a chance to become a part of a community and that would mean spiritual spiritual connectivity and i was glad that that was mentioned earlier and also of course the connections with each other. But first of all, I'm um, very sketchy. What is the state and the scope of connectivity in China? And the very basic foundation for that is, of course, that China has become a data superpower. It has the highest digital mobile usage penetration rate in the world. Nearly 93% of its uh, netizens use smartphones to connect. Um, with the internet, and you have already mentioned WeChat. This is the super app, which you can basically do everything, get a medical appointment, book your flight, um, connect with your friends, uh, do mobile transaction. This is another important thing. China really leads this. Um, there was a recent study um, by um, EMS, uh, a US uh, American uh, company, that the global, global average 31% uh, of the population make purchase of um, uh, financial transactions via an app, and in China it's 47%. So really mobile financial transactions is uh, at the very core also of Chinese uh, connectivity. And although we do see uh, increasingly concerns among Chinese netizens about uh, issues of privacy, um, but it still seems to be that convenience trumps these concerns. And um, so most of Chinese people are very prone to go online. And this has also been a driver of the overall digital um, transformation within China. Now, coming to uh, connectivity, two dimensions, basically, domestically and internationally. Um, domestically, China promotes connectivity to push data-driven innovation, and you may have heard about Made in China 2025. China wants to become high-tech leader um, in areas like artificial intelligence, robotics, talking about smart cities, and as I've heard and read from a lot of experts, that really China has made some progress in these areas, specifically artificial intelligence. China also pushes connectivity to expand the CCP's reach uh, to nudge people's behaviors. This is something very interesting. So Beijing is moving ahead to really build up a so-called social credit system. This is a monitoring and evaluation system to really um, monitor and evaluate companies, but also uh, individual citizens. And it's based on data from financial transactions, geolocation, medical history, friendship circles, and also comments you made in chat groups. We do have various um, pilot projects in place right now, and China says this is going to be set up in total until 2020. And we just have the very recent project in the Xiong'an uh, economic zone, which is also a pet project of Xi Jinping, saying people, if they live in houses which might be too big, or um, they might get sanctions, or if they, on the, on the positive side, kind of contribute to propagating how valuable and helpful the CCP is, they might get a, a good score. So this would impact, this is the overall uh, the sense of the system that every citizen gets uh, assigned a specific credit score and that can rise or fall according to your um, behavior. And I think we can learn from it once again uh, the understanding of the power of technology um, this has. Excuse me, I probably get some water now. <laughs> So really understanding the power of technology, um, which the CCP clearly has a good grasp on it. And um, also see, um, to be aware of the internal, um, so, so to say, conflicts, because China has the same problem also the US and Europe faces the, the tensions between the IT companies like Alibaba and Tencent who want to push ahead, but also then kind of trying to 
entangle them again or to, to really have them uh, framed within a, 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 a rule set which the Chinese government kind of uh, can control. And we should be on alert that this could be definitely a tool for a technocratic dictatorship. And Steinringen uh, had, has put it out in a book, The Perfect Dictatorship, um, that really China could involve, in the worst sense, into an Orwellian society. And that, that's, of course, clearly would impact also foreigners living and traveling um, to China. Internationally, very briefly, because my time's nearly up, we have heard about the, about the Belt and Road Initiative. I just wanted to uh, underline what has already been said. Interesting, though, though, also the Chinese notion has changed. It has been Belt and Road strategy, plan in the early stages, and then they kind of twisted it also linguistically to become a Belt and Road Initiative to kind of cover up the really commercial interests which are attached to it, but to really frame it more as a win-win situation. And the very core, of course, is the China-Pakistan economic corridor, and we have seen some progress. There has been the second phase now signs, but also last week, interestingly, Pakistan has cancelled a major, huge 14 billion dam project saying we don't want this much of a Chinese influence. This is on terms which are not transparent and we're a bit suspicious. So I think we have to closely watch what is going to happen on the China-Pakistan economic corridor here. And I would like to end um, coming to my last message on a very personal note, this vision of community um, my husband and I recently have come across a, a local initiative in Berlin called Philosophia Europa or Philosophia International. It's a in US-American couple. And what is on their heart is really to equip the next generation with a sense of being spiritually connected, but also being connected with each other. Um, they have an actual house, which they provide spaces for young students. And their vision is really to send these young people out. And they have a lot of Chinese who are very attracted by this idea, to send them out really to, be to become lights in the world. So they really become dots, and then hopefully form this lines of light, which we can see then from the airspace above. Thank you very much. Mm. Christine, thank you very much. Uh, you, um, you said that there is a lot that we can learn from the technological development, I understand, uh, that the, the Chinese are embarking upon in this particular area. Uh, but the question I've been asking myself is, you know, uh, how will we coexist together with these very, two very different approaches? Uh, ours, which invests ever more deeply into the protection of, of privacy. Um, and there is a lot of uh, EU legislation that comes into force next year. And the Chinese, where privacy doesn't seem to be a particular concern, to say the least. Uh, so what will it lead us to in, in the future? I think we, we, we need to discuss it uh, once, once Jason takes us into uh, an exploration of the new frontiers of technology, uh, because what uh, what we are still uh, missing from the discussion is the uh, the, the, the algorithmic uh, dimension, namely how will connectivity evolve uh, in the future? We are discussing fake news and disinformation. What will all that uh, look like uh, in the world of mixed reality or virtual reality when uh, silos are likely to be even even stronger? Uh, through uh, technological uh, development. Jason. Excellent. Pavel, thank you very much. And again, a great, a great summary and opening. And uh, big congratulations to Anne and Ricardo and Leo for a phenomenal program and, uh, and for, being, for bringing everyone together. Um, uh, I do want to pick up on this tech, tech, tech angle that was picked up this morning a number of times. And I don't want this to, dis to distract attention away from the social dimensions, because actually all of these technologies that we're talking about that Ian Bremmer raised this morning, from artificial intelligence to uh, the, the social media that's enabling fake news, are ultimately 
going to be social. Uh, I'm a quantum physicist by training. I uh, spent time in Silicon Valley doing quantum computing and molecular electronics. And I have to say, quantum physics isn't nearly as complex as people. People, at the end of the day, are far more difficult. And actually, one of the real questions to ask is, how will quantum computing get more complex when you add the people dimension into it? The uses, the applications, the aspirations. Um, and I want to try, in uh, the, the five minutes that I've got, to summarize three trends that I'm seeing that blend the technological and the social, and then pose one question, which I really think is important for the future, uh, for the conversations about futures and foresight that we should be looking at. Um, and for the first trend, I'm actually going to make this a little bit interactive. And since we're about halfway through and it's post-lunch, I'm going to ask everyone to stand up so that I can do a poll with you. <laughs> Excellent. So once everyone's up, I want you to stay standing if you have used an application on your smartphone today. OK, I saw one person sit down. So that, that's rare that you even get a few people to sit down. Now, I want you to stay standing if you have ever designed and programmed an application for your smartphone. Right. Trend number one. We don't have enough technologists who are shaping the way these technologies are being used in the room with the decision makers and policy makers. So in terms of futures and foresight, and in terms of the conversations that we need to be having, we need more of that interaction going on. So that's, but that is a key trend that I see across the board. That's why we set up an interdisciplinary community at UCL. It's why we're seeing universities starting to populate this, and next generation students who are coming in wanting to have interdisciplinary degrees, engineering with philosophy or politics, natural sciences with sociology. Um, and I think that that that's a trend that we need to be tapping into more, but not just as the next generation. We've got problems now that we need to be dealing with. Um, uh, that goes to, to uh, a second trend that I want to pick up with. Um, and it was one that was raised this morning with the question of, are we going to see Google, are we going to see Facebook and the UN Security Council? Well, I think that's, that's a poignant question, but it's much more complex than that. I think it's really a question about nested social contracts. What do I mean by that? We had Rousseau and Hobbes and Locke mentioned early on uh, today, the concept of the social contract between the citizen and the state. Well, the trend today is that we're all citizens of multiple communities. We're citizens of Facebook. We're citizens of Twitter. And uh, I'm, I'm not even going to ask how many of you have read in detail and understand the terms and conditions you signed to participate in those apps, because that's a poll that generally goes with one or two hands going up, and they're almost always lawyers. Um, uh, but the whole concept of citizenship and the whole concept of the social contract needs to be unpacked and put back together. And because we are seeing, you know, just the connectivity that Ulrich was talking about with, with the fact that we belong to multiple geographies because of the ease of aviation transport today, we also belong to multiple digital geographies. But that digital geography is much closer to the state of the Wild West. It's much closer to where aviation was at in the, late 18, in the early 1900s, or transport was at in the 18 and 1900s. And the, the actors that are shaping that space, the actors that are defining what the social contract is between the citizen and the individual, is happening uh, in, the, in the equivalent of the Wild West. But what happens in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas in this case. It does actually have global implications. You mentioned GDPR as the opening to this. Uh, and GDPR, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation of the EU, is an important step in that direction. But I run a large consortium of universities and researchers who work on the technology development. And when I say GDPR to a room of engineers developing technologies that have to do with privacy about this large, they stare at me and inevitably three hands go up, what, what's GDPR and why should I care? And I think that's an important thing. It, it, we're going to see the crux point happening at large corporations, at large entities that it's possible for the courts and legal structures to engage with, but that's not where technology development is happening. It's happening in the lab, it's happening in the garage, because technologies, I think this is, this is a, a, an important shift from the history of technology development in geopolitics. Historically, nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, armament, was all built by the state and controlled by the state. The technologies that are now shaping this landscape are not being developed. They're being developed mostly by entrepreneurs who see opportunities to make money. 
or potentially by social entrepreneurs who see the opportunity to make a difference. And in that distinction, I see one of the important conversations that we don't have enough in, uh, uh, in the conversation about how these technologies are shaping the geopolitical order. The opportunity not for the technologies to shape the order, but for the order we want to shape the technologies we need to enable and foster that. And that goes to the third trend that uh, I, uh, it was one that Nick and I talked about a little bit when Angela asked, uh, uh, what trends have you seen? And we actually went for trends that we haven't seen talked about a lot today. And one of the ones that came up was uh, inequality. Um, and I think the, that it, and this may seem like a bit of a curveball because often we think about inequality in terms of globalizations. But if I could summarize this trend in one catchphrase that would maybe work in the American political systems, uh, inequality is not driven by globalization. It's not Mexicans, it's not Muslims, it's microchips. Microchips have driven automation. Microchips have driven the ability of large corporations to have the global supply chains that they have and to eliminate a huge amount of the labor force that used to be required to have that sort of global reach. And understanding how technology can be used either to build global supply chains and automation that concentrate wealth or through social entrepreneurship, build uh, different visions of the future that we may want, to, uh, may want to accomplish, requires going back to those conversations between uh, technologists and colleagues like ourselves in the room here to bridge that divide. Um, uh, and so the final thing that I would say is, uh, so the three trends, uh, one, not enough intersection between the technology and policy communities at the highest levels in particular. Uh, two, nested social contracts, we need to be working on that more. Uh, and three, technology is one of the critical drivers of inequality, but it could also be one of the potential solutions if we can harness it. So the question uh, for the future of this digital state and the digital technology implication on the geopolitical order is really about which actors are going to play a critical role in shaping the education systems, the, 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 the conversations about the technology development pathways, about the technology roadmaps, and about the, techno the digital infrastructures that we need to accomplish different visions of the future. Is it going to be free market? Is it going to be China's version? Is it going to be a different version of, uh, of, of a new social contract that we need to negotiate? open questions for us to tackle. Yeah. <laughs> Jason, thank you very much. Um, so what you suggested is that um, we are living in an unprecedented period also from the point of view of what you call blending of technology and social. And it's true if we look back uh, at the industrial revolution, I suppose there was little of a scope for discussing in an open and democratic fashion the social contract uh, around the changes which were happening at that time. They were, they were simply happening and people had to adjust. So uh, hopefully the advantage of uh, where we are today is that we can uh, reflect on these things, we can, we can plan ahead. Uh, but the question I would have for, for all of you before opening up for, for questions and comments is how do we organize that particular conversation? Uh, because on the technological front, A, we, we don't quite know where technology is going in, uh, in all its reiterations. Uh, whether it's AI in, in, in medicine or whether it's uh, a flying car in, uh, in aviation, uh, we, can, we can sense uh, the trends, but we don't know which ones uh, will, will win the battle for tomorrow. So how do we, how do we organize that con conversation about uh, the social uh, contract? Uh, would you have any thoughts about this before I open up? I'll jump in with just yes. two quick thoughts. Um, uh, uh, the first thought is, is just on your point uh, of what happened in the first and second industrial revolutions. While it wasn't the most open and democratic conversations, we still came up with everything from uh, universal basic education to social welfare systems throughout the, the evolution of that period. So we do need a dynamic conversation about a wide range of potential policy options. Universal basic income and universal basic services isn't the solution to all technological futures. It's just one possible idea. More, more experimental development and conversations about what those policy options could be. But I think that leads into the second point, which 
I don't think any attempt to say this is the order or the structure that we need is inevitably going to fall on its face for all the reasons that we've heard. It's too uncertain. So we need a lot more experiments. And we need a lot more experiments at every level that bring these communities together, not so much in a, hi, I'm going to sit here and talk to you for a while, but in more of the sort of brainstorming conversation that Angela had us do just for a few minutes, much more depth. So just as one very brief example, we organize a program at UCL very modestly entitled How to change the world, um, and, <laughs> and we have 800 engineers who come together for two weeks, and we bring in 64 partners ranging from uh, UNDP down to local community partners, and they try and solve, they try and address a UN sustainable development goal in a particular geographic context. Now that's, the t now, that's not the only experiment, but we need many of those sorts of experiments that are a shotgun approach to innovation, as opposed to, here's the structure we want, here's the structure we need, uh, because the prescriptions are inevitably going to fall short of, of the changes that end up overtaking them. Yeah. Ulrich? Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit torn between two worlds now. I mean, for, for aviation, uh, the, the connectivity will drive consolidation. The consolidation will give, will give rise to uh, winners and losers, to those that will be able to compete globally and to those that will not. Those that will not are really the losers, both at industry level as well as government level. Uh, the issue then here becomes uh, basically the sort of red thread. You have a globalized economy and yet the political decision making is at national level. So in order to resolve that, you either have to renationalize your impact on the, on the global and, and, and become a kind of America first or make Britain first or whatever, or you have to open up and together with others create a regulatory framework globally that sets the rules. That's for the aviation part. What I'm more worried about is, 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 is the other part of that story, which is on, on the technology front. Um, my son calls himself a legal tech and he had attended a uh, a hackathon where within 24 hours they developed um, a machine uh, which, can, which has standardized legal um, answers to, to, any, to any area within 24 hours. So it was, they, they won the contest against 400 other law firms. And the, 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 the thrust of this is to destroy the white collar traditional law firms. So artificial intelligence is, is, is able to really go down that road of providing for standard, um, uh, as I said, standard responses, yes? Yeah. Now, now, who controls that? Um, the, the industry, or do you, can you have some kind of regulatory framework that, that forbids it or that, that, that censors it? I really don't know, so I'm more comfortable with my yeah. end of the thing, but as far as the technology is concerned, I'm lost. And, and whose interests are we going to protect? Exactly. Uh, the lawyers of today, uh, who surely want to keep the jobs, or the society of the future, that may be uh, catered for better uh, through multiple legal advice, uh, also coming through artificial intelligence. I well, think the artificial, what I'm saying is the artificial intelligence is, is really going through all of, the, all of the areas, so you have robots that can fly aircraft, you have a, um, drone technology that can also uh, be used to, to, to fly aircraft. You don't need any communication of humans between aircraft and satellites and, and ground. All of that is already, you know, is, is a given, so to speak. Um, but we're going through all of the white collar areas, and and who, how is this process going to be uh, going to be stopped or, yep. or, or influenced? Yeah, wonderful. I would love to ask you um, how would you go about. Uh, regulating issues uh, of artificial intelligence, because this is what uh, the Commission is, uh, is working on uh, for early next year. Uh, but I also don't want to spare anyone in the room a, a chance to comment or ask a, ask a question. So uh, would there be questions or comments at this stage? Is it, yes, please, yeah. If you could introduce yourself. And, and please wait for the microphone which is coming, yeah, almost there, yeah. Yes, hi, uh, my name is Sander Hapaerts. I'm at the Commission and I'm also part of the ESPAS uh, Young Talent Network. Uh, very interesting what we just heard from, from all of you. I was particularly happy uh, when Jason mentioned the inequalities because I, I think that was missing a bit uh, before. And uh, when talking about connectivity, I was thinking that even in Europe, the most connected region in the world, we still have many people that are unconnected. 
I mean, it could be people in regions where we still don't have uh, good road infrastructure, but also people living next to Brussels airport who have the planes above their heads, but they're not really part of all those networks. And uh, I'm wondering whether we, we are forgetting them in, in these debates. I sometimes feel in the institutions we have people who are working uh, within Europe, they work on environment policy, regional policy, internal market, but they forget whatever is happening outside our borders. And then we have people who work on the external and they think about geopolitics and all the challenges that are coming uh, up to us, but maybe we don't have enough connections between the two. So uh, what can we do when we work on further connecting the world to not forget the people within Europe who are not part of all these flows? Okay, very good. That's, that, that poses an interesting question of the right to be uh, connected. And should that right uh, overrule the economic rationale that uh, points towards growth being concentrated more in the cities? So should we maintain rural areas where, where they are with all the infrastructure and should we connect them better, even if it brings an enormous cost, even though we know that the economic rationale of today points towards uh, uh, the agglomerations getting bigger? Uh, so that's, that's one extremely relevant uh, question. I'm just looking quickly around, around the room if there, are, if there are others. Yes, please, yeah. If you could introduce yourself as well. Uh, uh, hi, Lars Brogius, uh, German Institute for International and Security Affairs in Berlin. Uh, thanks for this very inspiring talk that you gave, or presentation that you gave us. Question basically is, uh, we haven't talked so much about politics, is my impression here. Uh, we have talked about uh, interconnectedness and how, uh, what to do about connectivity, but what happens when politics kicks in, into connectivity? And uh, I think it was briefly mentioned, the example of pre-World War I uh, connectivity, which was pretty high. Uh, and people at that time thought, okay, this will continue, and then it didn't continue because politics kicks in. And let me give you four quick examples. What happens, for instance, uh, when we look at aviation industry when there is a crisis in the Persian or Arab Gulf uh, between Saudi Arabia and uh, Qatar? That might be the case. So this might have an impact on how uh, the Gulf airlines are able to operate. What happens... Uh, if a pipeline project uh, running through the Baltic Sea is not continued any further, what does that mean for, because of political reasons, what does that mean for connectivity? Uh, what happens if the Chinese super app is hacked? Uh, what, 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 what would be the consequences? What would politics be maybe forced to do then? And finally, maybe the idea of uh, what happens uh, when the big three corporations, Google, Facebook, and Amazon, when state regulations <laughs> starts to harden. It's, it's hardly conceivable that this will happen, but it might happen anyway. So politics has a role to play here with respect to connectivity. And I would be really interested to hear your thoughts about that. Thanks. Right, thank you so much. That, that opens an enormous uh, territory for, for the discussion. And now I'll, I'll warrant Parag that I will start from him when it comes. But let, let me, let's just take the third question and then get your answers. It's okay. Lucio Gussetti, European Commission. Uh, just following up this question, uh, connectivity is about moving people. What about the people that are moved? What we see today is that we want to build walls, we want to stop people from moving. Is connectivity a nersatz for movement of people? Or, thank you. Wonderful, Parag. I, you've been warned. Uh, uh, you painted for us at the outset uh, this wonderful uh, picture of our connecti connectivity getting ever deeper. Um, but what about uh, the governance uh, of it? And what about the political implications that connectivity brings? I'll take these uh, maybe quickly in, in reverse order. On the borders and walls, I mean, of course, this is what dominates your headlines in Europe, but let's remember how statistically insignificant it is in the grand scheme of things when it comes to global migration. I know you're not accustomed to someone coming to a European audience and calling you statistically insignificant. Uh, I'm very aware of that. But you need to be told it, because if I don't tell it to you, no one else will. But, but it is a numerical fact. Uh, you know, global migration is climbing very, very substantially. Most human migration is not 
from, you know, is not uh, African refugees coming to Europe. Most human migration is across the developing world. It's south-south, it's, uh, it's uh, it, within Asia, it's within Africa and so forth. So whatever walls that get put up, uh, you know, in Serbia or Hungary are, are literally insignificant when you're talking about a world of 300 million people living outside their country of origin, billions of, you know, uh, more than a billion people crossing borders every year, country after country that's moving towards visa on arrival, visa-free uh, entry programs, begging to launch new entrepreneur visa programs to make it easier for foreigners to come and live in their countries. And that's just the micro-politics today that, that is overwhelming on, uh, evidence in contrast to, to the thesis of the question. But, but perhaps even more significant in the long run is the supply-demand mismatch in labor markets. In the very same countries, your own, that are uh, you know, getting, getting conservative and worried about migration have the lowest fertility rates, right? You have, you're the ones who have the labor shortages in your uh, engineering sector, software, logistics, you name it. You have the massive deficits and the surpluses where you also have a growing number of graduates in those very sectors where you need are lying to the south and in the east of you. So you may choose to put up those walls. You may implement whatever politics you choose. There is national sovereignty precisely in the area of human migration. It might be one of the only areas left where there is, to some degree, a sense of genuine sovereignty. And it's always been the case that it is the most sensitive area uh, of national regulation in the sense of border. So it's no surprise that this is an area where we talk about the return of sovereignty and nationalism and walls going up. But again, it's your choice to do that and you are very much in the minority of the world population when it comes to the, the countries that are choosing to do the exact opposite because they're trying to bring in talent uh, as, as much as possible. So again, you can do, you can pull a Brexit, right? Every country has a right to th fling itself off an abyss, into an abyss. Uh, you may choose to do that but you are not representative of where, where the world is going. And I urge you all simply to learn from history, you know, which is that great empires, great societies, great cities, uh, what they all have in common over thousands of years is that they are open. You know, they are open to flows um, of people. You can certainly be selective, but you really can't live without them. You will decrease in relevance as a result of being less connected. So sorry for the long answer. Um, on the... On the politics of the, the connectivity, again, it, it was ever thus, right? Uh, uh, building connectivity outward, whether it is uh, Huawei building out the telecommunications infrastructure in Africa or whether it is the, the railways uh, across uh, Eurasia today, it already is political. It's not that it later on gets, uh, gets politicized. Uh, the, the, the manipulation, uh, the tensions between the, the, the sort of two sides of a supply-demand relationship are always there, and they do get more and more uh, uh, intense. And I think this speaks actually in a, in a roundabout way coming back to the question that was um, that Jason began to answer, uh, which is this issue of how do we, in answering your question, Pablo, how do we regulate this? Well, it actually happens in two ways. One is the way that Jason mentioned, which is it's multi-stakeholder in the sense of public-private dynamics and conversations at a local level, but it's also through cross-border expansion, uh, commercial expansion that it happens. Because in, in Brussels and Washington, you cannot determine uh, what, uh, ch how China exports cyber surveillance technologies. It just does it, right? So it's great that Microsoft wants to offer a suite of smart city monitoring technologies and dashboards, and it wants to sell it country by country, but guess what? China has a rival product that is more uh, in line with the political objectives of certain governments, and they're going to buy that system. So you can't dictate inter trans transnational regulatory policy from a third-party location. You almost have to be in on, on, on the fight, if you will. Right now, as we speak, the WeChat suite is being repackaged, renamed, repurposed, and relicensed, and re, you know, for other markets around the world, in ASEAN, in the Middle East, right? There's nothing that Facebook, Google, or Amazon can do about it. And this speaks to a broader point about how you influence societies. You simply cannot influence countries unless you are uh, connected uh, to them, if you will. If you're not investing in Russia, trading with Russia, uh, or Iran, uh, for that matter, you're basically ceding uh, the ground. And that's how the real world works. When it, it applies to global governance as well. We're so often looking for 
reform of multilateral institutions and we, we, we measure, uh, we have for a long time made this mistake up until 2014, 2015, global governance conversations veered in the direction of saying, well, let's measure the voting rights that emerging markets have in the World Bank and IMF boards and that will be a sign as to whether or not these countries are being uh, participating in global governance based on our existing multilateral order. Well, nothing of the sort is, is really relevant. Who cares if the voting shares of China go up by 1% or 2%. They just founded an entire parallel multilateral financial system with dozens of members and hundreds of billions of dollars of capital. That's the new dynamic of global governance. It's not voting shares in there, here and there in the existing order. It's the construction of a whole new order. It's competition. You have competition in every possible area, whether it's normative or whether it's commercial. And you'll never be influential, whether Europe or America, if you're not participating in that uh, competition. I was going to make the point about, say, a point about inequality, but I've gone on too much. So. Right, thank you very much. Uh, I mean, to your, to your point uh, that you started with, um, that what, whatever Europe is facing is, uh, is a drop in the bucket uh, compared to the global trends, that, that is true, but uh, I just have to make one small correction that um, in the mi migratory crisis, we still offered more um, protection for refugees and more asylum than anybody else. I think that, I think it does. I think it does matter. It does make a difference um, because there is something called the Geneva Convention still out there. And if we want to have a, a world of rules, uh, uh, this type of uh, mechanism has to be taken into account. Uh, Christine, can you get? back to any of the questions that you yes. want to, but, but maybe in particular this, this, um, uh, this issue of the technological um, development and how, and, and do you think China will want to export its model and will, will the rest of the world be susceptible to China's influence? Right. Um, yes, first of all, I would like to connect it to this, this question about um, the role of politics and yeah. um, connectivity. I mean, the Chinese example clearly tells us, I mean, the, the Chinese government has a very centralized, um, top-down effort domestically and internationally, and it works pretty well, but again, um, I think there is space, and also Beijing senses it, that this, this has to be, to a certain extent, has to be a multi-stakeholder approach. Because, for example, domestically, the issue of privacy is now slowly, slowly moving to the center. Also, of course, mostly because customers, Chinese customers, um, complain mostly not vis-a-vis -vis the party state, but vis-a-vis -vis the IT companies about data leakages, which kind of happens frequently now. And also when it comes, of course, to trans-border actions in e-commerce, there has to be, the issue of privacy has to be tackled. And China is actually, has increasingly, uh, has astonishingly made some progress in, in the last six months. A a lot of stipulations about standardization of privacy issue, how to protection of personal data, and actually very much looking towards the EU, interestingly, to kind right. of t take this into place. And internationally, yes, um, of course, uh, in, for example, in the eastern parts of Europe, also in the Balkans, I mean, there is this sense also due to lack of alternatives we as uh, Europeans offer um, that the Chinese um, also would put, put quotation marks um, around this issue of model, which is actually not used by the Chinese government. They talk about a China solution, though, right now, the Zhongguo Fang'an or Zhongguo Zhihui, the China wisdom, which should be exported. But again, one of the biggest uh, troubles, what, what I have heard from, from Pakistan, from Africa, about a Chinese, the Chinese government, the local authorities, the companies, is how about communication, about frictions on the ground, social dimensions, cultural interactions. And I think there's a sense, at least on the local level, of an attractiveness to this multi-stakeholder approach and how to communicate really and not only bring in money and set up roads, but to really embed this into a, a larger social what, um, what uh, sorry, Jason was talking about. So, I mean, how should we react? We should be, as I said, clearly aware of what's going on and have no, don't be naive and don't believe this fantastic globalization and we're going to, to uh, make the world a better place, what, what Xi Jinping offers. But there's much more than Xi Jinping. We have the young Chinese generation, which are, and we did a survey on that, very open actually towards notions of Western value, of transparency, of, of um, 
of um, freedom of the press. And I think we also have to offer them something. And I think even within, as I said, the Chinese government on a local level, there is a, a notion and space of to, to really talk about issues of privacy and, uh, as I said, uh, communication and the frictions between IT companies. Although they have cl they're closely associated with the party state, but still, the more profit they make overseas, they kind of also have more leverage uh, in this whole game. So I th in, in, in a sense, I think China and Europe and the US have a lot of similar problems. It's not that China yeah. is playing a totally different game in that yeah. sense. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, fascinating and reassuring to a large extent as well, <laughs> uh, because it shows that the, the two civilizations uh, are talking to each other, which is always most important. Uh, uh, Jason, perhaps if you could um, get back to the question inequality. about inequality, namely, namely um, I mean, do we really aim at connecting everyone um, or yeah. do we need strategy also on, as to how to connect people? Yeah, I, I, I think that's a, it's a fantastic question. And I, I just want to start off by using another provocative phrase um, uh, and, and putting the idea of inequality in the same sentence with middle-aged white male. That's not something that you would typically put together. But if you look at those who voted for Brexit and did the democratic self-harm of Brexit or the democratic self-harm of the Trump administration, it was all, you look at the polls and it's, it's related to at least the self-perceived inequality of a large proportion of middle-aged white males who are not very technologically literate, who may be on Facebook, maybe on a few others, have a basic level of connectivity. But I think there's an important distinction between whether or not you have access to your smartphone, whether or not you can get online, and whether that's an empowering thing that enables you to do something, to actually have connectivity as a result of it, or simply allows advertisers and businesses to connect to you. So I, I completely agree that there's not enough uh, conversation about inequality in the domestic sense because I think that you know linking back to the, the, the question about politics and the transition of, of, uh, of how these technologies are going to link to politics actually fundamentally they are part of our political discourse of changing our political landscape right now but it's all happening ad hoc there's not a, there, there are opportunists who are grabbing uh, a, a small windows of opportunity that they see whether to intervene in elections or simply to grab a financial market that wasn't there before. Um, but this is where there's a serious role for thinking through systematically the different options we want and how we develop the skills needed to engage in digitization. The skills for a digital world are not just, I know how to get online. Even programming an app isn't really, as I used it as sort of a, 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 a mock uh, uh, example, but being able to understand how your data is used, how you can use the connectivity to demonstrate the skills and abilities you have, whether digital skills or otherwise, to a broad range of communities around the world and offer services to someone in China who's looking for a particular set of skills you may have even if you live just outside of Berlin. Um, there's all sorts of different ways of thinking about that, but we've barely begun to map what that actually looks like. Most digital skills uh, conversations are still, at, certainly at local government level, at a basic, can you get online? Um, and that's not nearly adequate. Uh, going back to the first and second industrial revolution, the whole reason primary, uh, universal primary and then secondary education was brought online is because nations realized they needed their workforces to be able to engage in a higher level of conversation and a higher level of work than just tilling the field. And as a result of that, we saw a phenomenal transformation. We need that same conversation now. Thanks so much, Jason. I would just make one caveat that a lot of this, these responses to the um, uh, Industrial Revolution came in response to the disruptions that, uh, that were produced. Uh, I, I'm leaving out the fact and, that there was 20 years of suffering in exactly, between, so exactly. hopefully we can skip so that. So hopefully yes. we can, we can uh, pre-design a system in advance of these disruptions. Um, uh, them, th yes. That would be quite an advantage. Now, I'll, I'll shortly open up for a final short round of questions and comments, so please signal them to me. But, but before I do that, Ulrich, this question about the uh, the movement of, of people that, uh, I mean, for the aviation industry, that's, that's surely uh, an existential question. Uh, I mean, I guess you're doing fine uh, as, as things stand, but it is true that, uh, that relatively 
uh, speaking, there is, there is a lot of migratory movements, uh, but, uh, but uh, you know, people could be moving as much as capital is moving, for example, uh, and, and they are not. So what, what trends do you see uh, in the future when it, comes to, when it comes to the movement of people? I think it's a bit linked to the question of, of, of the role of politics. Um, the, the, originally, the idea was to move away from politics and to have the industry uh, be deregulated or liberalized and, and just develop an own, an own dynamics and let the number of people who wish to travel be the ones that travel. Um, then, of course, you had to have some provisions about uh, environmental protection and, and consumer protection and so on. Uh, but this turned into a dynamics um, of numbers, of, 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 of the sheer dimensions. So um, let's not forget that we have 30,000 aircraft in the sky over Europe every day, that there are 900 million European passengers around per year, that there are over 3 billion um, annually globally. Um, and these dimensions then make it again interesting for polit politics to, to intervene. Um, but I think that, you know, my, my, my concern is that um, there is no, like, like in the Lehman Brothers in the financial sector, there, there is no international regulatory framework that gives us guidance on what to do in this ever-increasing uh, dynamic uh, movement of people that has an economic relevance. There are, there was another question that was raised, there are indeed even in Europe uh, an increasing number of underserved regions um, as a result of the fact that the, the market is going along where the market is the strongest. Motorways are not, do not have exits for every little uh, village. You, you, you go for the, for the mainstream and the traffic mainstream concentrates on uh, where, uh, you know, where, where the most money can be made, but where the most demand is. So um, yes, there, are, there is an increasing discrepancy between winners uh, and losers on the market side. The governments uh, appear to be increasingly interested in intervening, but actually either create distortions or micromanage, but don't set uh, a common set of, 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 um, uh, of framework regulations, either at national or at regional, or certainly not at global level. Um, so the, the, the question is a very yeah. valid one. Uh, and I haven't got an answer. Yeah, yep. thank you so much. Uh, so we have seven minutes and 44 seconds right, right now, and I will want to warn the speakers that I will come back to them for the final takeaway. That, that will be just one sentence, as we have done in the previous sessions. Uh, but before that, we had, a, we had two questions, uh, actually, uh, right here. Uh, we could have the microphone. And please introduce yourselves. Hi, um, my name is Mahmoud. I'm quite hesitant to speak, but and in the morning, encourage me to speak or ask a question if I have one. So thank you very much. Um, I was just wondering for the connectivity, let's suppose, why would a population, let's say, capitalize on connectivity? Let's suppose um, in Africa, people don't get industrialization off the ground. Let's suppose the population grows faster than their capacity to grow GDP. Let's suppose their GDP per capita is worse in 20 years than today. Um, so it's about why would what happens if people capitalize on connectivity? I can't say for the wrong reason, but um, why would people capitalize on connectivity? And what would be the reciprocal um, choice for geostrategic the game changes? Like um, you, you wouldn't like entrepreneurs to become entrepreneurs because they have no job, or, but rather they see an opportunity. So can connectivity backfire in some way? And in the specific case, maybe in Africa, that next generation may be worse off than today. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've, we've heard recently of a, of a World Bank study uh, of textile industry in, in Africa that pointed to a reasonable prospect only in Ethiopia for the development of textile industry given the trends when it comes to labor costs and trends in productivity. So it's true that um, industrialization in particular is, is no longer uh, an avenue for many of the emerging economies. So, and the phenomenon of premature deindustrialization also uh, speaks volumes about this. Um, and the gentleman next uh, next to you, yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jakob Warburg. I'm with the Danish Foreign Ministry. 
Um, connectivity is also about money and capital flows. And um, uh, it seems like that there are uh, increasing possibilities for capital to avoid uh, taxation from nation states. And at the same time, it looks like uh, there is an increasing need for funding of social programs, uh, especially regarding education in a digital economy. So I would very much like to hear your views on, on, uh, on this problem that the, and perhaps a decreased ability for nation states to, to tax uh, production and at the same time an increased need for social programs uh, to, uh, to diminish the uh, rising inequality. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will have a quick look. Yes, so this will have to be the last question. Yes. Quickly this time. So you have to speak. You just have to speak. It's on. Cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know the, uh, sorry, Alan Ruddock of SWAF Horizons. I know the uh, title points in a particular direction, but I did notice as well, subsequently, it seems that you're all pretty confident that the trend is unidirectional. It is going in this one connectivity direction. It just seems, given what's happened over the past 10 years and uh, populism and the fact that politics, frankly, is always local, at least to some extent, probably quite a large extent. I just want to know if the panel is really that confident that, that, there, that there couldn't be a major reversal here. All right, thank you so much. In a way, these three questions belong, belong together because they, they raise the issue of whether connectivity will in fact lead to, to a rosy future. Uh, we have three minutes and I'll suggest that in reverse order, I give uh, our speakers a minute each, uh, but we'll also hope for this, uh, for this uh, one, one takeaway from this session. So Jason, why don't you start? So thank you very much. Very briefly, um, uh, connectivity already backfired for Africa. It was colonialism. And actually this relates very, very much to the next point in that the new digital colonialism is not, it's not operating in exactly the same model, but it is exactly the ability of large global uh, enterprises to be able to extract rents from populations without having to pay taxes back to those populations or provide services above and beyond whatever they're being paid for. Um, and I do think that that is a very worrying trend. Um, and it goes to the question of whether or not we're going to see reversals in connectivity. I don't think we're going, we're not going to see, I would postulate, reversals in te technological connectivity or technological progress. There's just, it, no matter, every time states have tried to intervene to stop technological progress, it goes somewhere else. And it allows for national competitiveness, and that's the argument as to why do it. It's, it's national competitiveness. You want to have the most competitive economy. You want to have as much connectivity as you can. I can see some big geopolitical game changers that could happen that would impact many of the, the, the more uh, geographically tied aspects of the connectivity that Parag outlined really well. Um, but ultimately, I don't think that's going to reduce uh, humanity's digital connect, connected to the digital world. And if we just focus on that as one of the major game changers, I see that driver propagating where it goes, anybody's game. And there's a, it's still very much at that Wild West stage. Um, uh, and uh, one key takeaway, uh, I think that relates to, uh, uh, to Kristen's point about uh, visions and narratives, that we need more focus on that. Yeah. Kristen. Hey, yeah, thank you very much. Um, on, on the questions, um, I mean, in the Chinese case, I, I hope I, I, ha I created a sense of awareness that, in the domestic sense at least, connectivity for, for the Chinese society, and again, also for foreigners to get plucked in, the surveillance dimension is, of course, uh, kind of called backfire, but risk. And another example, very recently, because of e-commerce and, of course, the then the plug-in into the international flow, um, there were these, in Chinese, they were called this Taobao Tun. These are, Taobao is the equivalent to eBay. So these these villages and very remote rural areas, although connected um, digitally, which become rich overnight. These people who put on things online and organize local networks then to ship this according to customers' needs. And now the Chinese government 
ask the companies to introduce a tax. Everybody has to individually register and to, for the first time, they have to be tax standardized. They say, of course, this is about the quality of products, but this created a massive out, uh, outcry within this new community. First of all, you, you help us to, to get our share in these new opportunities, and now you're going to take this away from us again. And the companies get it, and the Chinese state, and probably they, they divide it up. So this was a kind of, yeah, what could also then happen. And uh, finally, I wanted to read the, the point which has been made increasingly throughout um, this morning also about the notions, really, the narratives and the visions. And I, once again, I was very grateful for Professor um, Chu saying, uh, sensing this search and this longing within China for what is Chinese culture, what is our vision, how can we contribute? And I really would, would invite all of us to take this seriously, not only in regard to China, but there's clearly the sense, and I think we all sense it to have to talk more about this. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Ulrich. Um, if I could just summarize a bit broader, yes, um, and the takeaway, the connectivity is a good thing. Um, it's a good thing, the social connectivity is, the digital connectivity is, um, the, the, the mobility uh, is because it promotes economic growth, it promotes knowledge, it promotes information, it leads to a global dimension. Um, Populism isn't the consequence of, of connectivity. Populism is the consequence of the fact that the political class has failed to translate the advantages of, of connectivity into a dynamic, forward-looking, anticipative, anticipative politics. So we need a next generation um, set of politicians, and we're getting some, who, who can address these issues. But that would be my takeaway, that we need a regulatory framework at international level to really deal with the global dimension yeah. of connectivity. Thank you so much. And now, Para. I just want to make sure that we're not confusing the terms connectivity and globalization again. You don't, you're not reversing connectivity. You may build connectivity with less intensity and depth and breadth and speed than we, than we may be at present, but that doesn't look likely to happen if you look at infrastructure spending patterns around the world. It's increasing drastically, not decreasing in every layer of connectivity, transportation, energy, and communications. What, we're, what, what the question, I think, is rather suggesting is what are the areas where, despite all the connectivity, you may see less intensity take place. So there's many, many examples of that, and many of them are very positive. So for example, there's lots of stranded energy assets in China. There's lots of pipelines that have been built that aren't going to be used, uh, because instead they've been moving very rapidly towards a, you know, a alternative and renewable sources of energy, and so they don't need that. So this relates to Africa, because uh, of course China has made massive investments in infrastructure resources to accelerate the extraction of raw materials from Africa, but if you look at its declining uh, oil imports, from a country like Angola, for example, uh, that's decreasing usage of existing connectivity, uh, but it doesn't mean that the connectivity is not there, right? And for example, African oil exports to America have plummeted to practically zero because now North America is the largest oil and gas producer on Earth. It doesn't need African oil anymore. So this gets to this point about um, botching or blowing connectivity, the neo-mercantilism that has affected uh, uh, Africa because of Chinese and, and Asian uh, economic practices leads Africans to a state where, because of the combination of that and automation, they're never going to follow the pattern of industrialization that we expect societies to go through. They have to very rapidly move towards being services economies, specifically non-tradable services economies, which means they need to invest a lot more in their own internal infrastructure and urbanization in jobs and education, healthcare. These are things that aren't being automated by robots tomorrow, and they can't be outsourced to China because you still, as an African family with an African child, send your child to an African school taught by African teachers, right? So in fact, this is, the, this is one of the areas that's quite common around the world. We all need to be investing a lot more in, in these non-tradable services areas that actually tend to be higher value and pay higher wages. So we need to see that happening in Europe. We have to see it in America. But we have to train our populations for that as well, which is why this is a point Jason made way earlier, but it's not Mexico, uh, it's microchips, right? And so I think we have to, to focus on that rather than on blaming each other. So just the takeaway, the solution to the problems of connectivity is not turning off connectivity, it's more connectivity. Those who are disconnected don't benefit from protectionism, right? Brexit, Trump, uh, cutting the TPP trade agreement, these are self-defeating policies. The fact that they happen doesn't make them right. 
right? They are exhibit A in stupidity from which we are supposed to learn, right? The solution to lacking connectivity is almost always more connectivity. The solution to the digital divide, which we used to talk about so much if we were here 10 years ago, was not, okay, well, let's just slow down internet penetration. Right? That's not the solution. It's actually accelerate uh, digital inclusion. And so that's what we wind up realizing more and more. And we, it comes down to... Uh, you know, very important point, which is this this fact that we've been in this gap between the what's called the installation phase versus the the, 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 the deployment deployment versus the installation phase of certain technologies. And there's recent evidence that that, uh, that where people have been talking about a digital middle class emerging finally uh, in the United States on the back of uh, Amazon. Uh, logistics, warehousing, e-commerce. So the more we spread these technologies and train workers to participate in the new economy, the more you start to spread the benefits of connectivity. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, we have to leave it there, as Nick Gowing used to say in his uh, previous job. Um, <laughs> and, and what I have in front of... Hmm? I did say more. You did say, oh, of course, no, but at the end, just like me here, me now. <laughs> But what I have, what I have in, front of, in front of my eyes is this banner which was uh, um, displayed at the Brussels airport for about a year in 2015. This time it's different. Huh? It was about elections to the European Parliament, and I think this time is different, so that worked. Uh, but the same banner we could um, hang up after this session, saying this time must be different also with respect to connectivity and how we manage connectivity, learning from the past, and uh, applying our best foresight and anticipation uh, with respect to the future. Thank you so much to uh, all the four panelists for a fascinating discussion. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah. And we now have a 25-minute uh, coffee break, after which we will reunite for the final session. <laughs>